I want to get to a few documentaries that I saw over the few days that we had off, one of them about the American Gladiators on Netflix, and one that I've only gotten through two of the three parts in the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary. He has certainly lived a life worthy of documenting this way. But to me, the most interesting fact in the entire first two episodes uh, is that Arnold Schwarzenegger owns a tank. Put it on the poll at Levitard okay. Show. Are you surprised that Arnold Schwarzenegger owns a tank? Yes don't or no? Mean, don't mean to be that guy, but I've known that about Arnold for quite some time. Oh, my oh, God, you're that Terminator. guy. Jesus. I mean, He's that guy. That's a throwback. We haven't had that one in a while. I'm um, sorry, but it's, it's com- I thought it was common knowledge. Uh, put that on the poll as well, Juju. Is it common knowledge that Arnold Schwarzenegger owns a tank? What was not common knowledge for me in that documentary was the family issues that he had. I was not aware of the backdrop of where he came from. I also from. knew that. They glossed over in a documentary. Again, this, this happens uh, every once in a while. He's that guy. Uh, they, they glossed over his personal life and the whole cheating with... Uh, Either Maria Shriver? The, Maria no, Shriver. His housekeeper. Well, no, cheating with his housekeeper. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he just said, uh, you know, my personal life is perfect. Did you not know that? <laughs> that did his personal not... life is perfect? They glo- did they you did... not know that he had a child with a housekeeper? I knew that. that was co- I thought that was common knowledge. <laughs> He's that guy. <laughs> I did know that. They didn't address it, is my point. I knew it, and it was not you, addressed. Do you remember how that played out in the public where... We he was kind of denying it, and then we saw a picture of the, the child. <laughs> well, it's, it's even worse. It was like take your son to work day, and so he shows up in the kitchen, and Maria Shriver and others saw this child in the kitchen and said, "Wow, that looks a lot like Arnold." <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was discovered. <laughs> so they will address it if you finish the documentary. Okay. Uh, so he actually does. So you're at, you're you're throwing shade on him when in fact he, he's lying again. You liar. I, no, he admitted that he only watched two out of the three. The third episode is worth watching, but he admits to what he did. It's hard to, it's, uh, well, it's hard it's to deny it's, when it's, the baby has your face. <laughs> and he's a body filter. <laughs> the baby was born with an Austrian accent. <laughs> Uh, I want to get into with Amin here uh, something that was, I imagine, strategically placed last Friday before a long four-day holiday weekend so that people wouldn't spend the entire next few days talking publicly about what happened at ESPN in what I believe can be described I don't know what second place would be as the second worst day or the, the worst day in the history of ESPN. The worst public day in the 40-year history of the company where they let go of Jeff Van Gundy blindsiding a 17-year employee. They let go of Susie Colbert, 28 years. Uh, Max Kellerman gone. Uh, You got McShay gone. Uh, Jalen Rose, Steve Young, Keyshawn Johnson, Jay Williams, uh, Vince Carter, uh, Steve Levy. And this is how much unrest there was at ESPN. Wrote on Twitter, feel numb, been trying all day to find the right words. Maybe there aren't any. People assumed he'd been let go because he just wrote that tweet about colleagues being let go. We've seen this day coming for a long time as Disney tries to correct some of its errors with ESPN people that are largely interchangeable. And while Amin, ESPN took the public hit on Friday for shedding those costs... I thought to myself, as it happened, are they actually going to feel this beyond this day? Is it going to be something that empirically puts off viewers or any of those people that were let go or all of those people? Is anybody who consumes ESPN now going to say, never mind, I'm out on ESPN? Because while it's a huge public relations hit, I think you take the hit in order to save the money if you're cold about saving money because you got to run your business. I don't like saying that. Hell, I feel after watching that day, I'm like, whoa, we got out of there in the nick of time. We got out of there just in time because I'm positive that what happened, Max Kellerman was given the slots and the places to replace where it is that we were, the hours, the man hours that was given to Max Kellerman. And then he looks up and he's disposable too, 
I mean, your thoughts as you watch that happen, and does it mean anything beyond the hurt and the public relations hit? David could probably speak to this better, but this is this is all cap clearing, right? This is this is you got to hit a certain number by end of Q3, and they do it this way so they could spread it out among you know uh, across the books, and in essence. No, the answer to your question is anyone goes, well, I'm not watching the NBA Finals anymore because Jeff Van Gundy isn't calling them as the as a as a color analyst. The reality is no, the people tune into the NBA Finals for the NBA Finals. They don't tune in for Jeff Van Gundy. But what's the empirical harm? Harm? To whom? To ESPN. They take a bad day. Look, yeah, they go. No, there I are four days. They kept it. They did this. They knew this was coming for a long time, and there was a spot in the schedule. It's only the hot dog eating, and then people will be kind of off on content, and they will forget from by by Wednesday. Friday's news doesn't echo unless it's something a lot but, bigger than a public no, but relations. It, it's June thirtieth is, is it's the end not, of the second quarter. Yeah, that's what it is. So I, I don't think that they chose. That that that's actually makes us feel old when you're talking about a news dump the way you're describing. That's not how life is anymore. Because here we are talking about it now, and there was plenty of time to talk about it on Twitter and various other platforms. So I don't believe they hid this at all. It's definitely quarter related, yeah. fiscally. And so what you're asking is, will anyone's? So I lied again. Yes, <laughs> that's three if you're keeping track. Do you get fines for the number of lies, or you can just lie <laughs> we, as we much as you want? Stu Gatz would literally seat? be paying us. <laughs> He'd be paying my salary. Well, that's <laughs> one way that we can improve the business. We can charge people for telling mistruths. I've got one place where I think you're going to feel it, and it's been a dilution over the course of several years. But when I watch college game, it's one of the yeah. few things that I watch start to finish. If you see the personnel that has left that show, uh, even Gene Wojciechowski is not like a loss that you'll feel like you think – well, well, how's that really going to hurt? But a huge part of College Game Day's experience is a heartwarming piece. And they've pivoted. They've lost so many great reporters that were in charge of that. They're going to have to rebuild that aspect of it. The Bear left. David Pollack left. And I think one of the things that we all really enjoy about Saturday mornings has been diluted by degrees. And when you, you don't necessarily feel just one absence, but when you put them all in a pile, I think you're going to get a worse product. You know what it's like? when local newspapers started dying. He was like, oh, it doesn't matter. Like, the New York Times still around the watch, but we got newspapers. We don't need local papers. But the reality is local papers co cover local things very well and very detailed in a way that national things can't. And so there's a bunch of stuff. Yes, I think Mike's right. There's a bunch of stuff where the quality is going to drop because the, the people who were on top of it from a hyper-focus level are not there anymore. But... I don't know if the the way the industry is moving, I don't know if quality is what's going to keep people around anyway. Well, let's let's continue to I'm sorry David. Uh, let's continue to look at Game Day, which is one of those daytime program original studio shows that we all agree. This is the best studio show that they do. It's the only thing that can compete with Inside the NBA. They lost Rinaldi and they didn't quite make up that gap by piecemealing it together. And now they've lost the piecemeal and they've lost David Pollock, who is essential while Corso goes through his stuff. And they're more leaning into McAfee's brand because only his his position on that show is going to be further amplified. And there's all sorts of interesting gossip about how big of a fan and how or how not big of a fan David Pollock was that his spot was seemingly taken out from under him. But you lose these pieces. You lose the bear. These are the sticky things that oh, build but the, the culture qu the around the The question I'm asking you, because that, that show did numbers and does numbers. The question I'm asking you is, when Amin says or you say that the quality is going to go down, my question is, does it matter? Because with those two brands, it's not just... College Game Day is a brand. It's also ESPN as a brand. You are talking about the biggest sports media brand that there is. Where do I have to dilute the quality for you to actually leave? For you to notice that you're gone? With all due respect, they have felt the loss in the ratings. Big Noon Saturday has eaten into their audience. But none of that is really in their head. What's in their head is the amount of subscription revenue is mm -hmm. just going down. And therefore, it's like the regional sports networks in baseball. They had to find a way above, right? It flows up. It comes down from Disney. And, he, and they say to ESPN, much like Amin said, here's where your number is, Jimmy, and get to it. 
and you can fire 20 guys at a million or one guy at 20 million. Which is it better to do? They're really banking on Pat a lot to not just carry his own show, but with game day, considering that they've lost rights to all these competitors, I'm going to want to watch a pregame for my team. And when the Big Ten is now on other networks and it's spread out and there's more of a piece of the pie, if I'm tuning in, I want to see the Ohio State preview. But he's I want already, to see those people on he's site. He's baked in. So the McAfee deal is a baked deal. So they get to amortize the, his cost, annual cost, over all the different mm -hmm. programs he does, all the hours he takes up. So that means versatility matters. So your question about quality, versatility matters more than quality. And, and Mike, you know, you said the most important part, which is the rights. That's what dictates are you watching this or not. It's not anything else. It's the rights. You're watching where the game is and, and your affinity towards – these individual stuff is not quite as strong as your affinity to watching the actual game. I'm more inclined. Yeah. If Miami, for whatever reason, is on Fox, I want to see the Fox people if they're on site. But we talked about this with Reese Davis several months ago, and it's basically an us versus them thing. And he even admitted ESPN's going to focus on the games that they have the rights to on mm -hmm. college game day. So while Big Noon Saturday had its kickoff and it was the big game between Michigan and Ohio State – I was still watching College Game Day because I love the show so much. But Ronaldo leaves to Fox. Bear leaves to Fox. I don't have the heartwarming story that makes me care about Purdue football more than I've ever had. <laughs> I think that, uh, and I think I heard you right, did you feel that there was a speed bump in the middle of Gene Wojciechowski's name? Yeah. It's a tough one. It is tough. Yeah. I'm just saying. I, it's Woj. It, Wojo. It sounded like you were a little afraid of it. When David mentions that versatility is more important than quality, Max Kellerman was pretty versatile. But like, he was completely replaced by McAfee. But, uh, and, it's, and it's not just that. It's also because he, he Max makes a certain number. You get rid of Max on June 30th, regardless of whether he was worth the number or not, you get rid of him and you replace him with someone who makes a fraction of that, and it's not McAfee, right? The reality is there's a bunch of little people that you may not have heard of or you've heard of that don't make that much money who are going to be li doing the lift on a lot of this stuff. And they're banking on, you're going to keep watching, for instance, you know, myself, Rachel Nichols, Tracy McGrady was on a show that was got great ratings and was the commissioner's favorite NBA show. And, you know, things happened and we all left and they replaced it with a new show called NBA Today. Uh, I don't think the NBA, people care. The NBA has been frustrated by their studio show for a while. Mm. It's not terribly surprising to me that Jalen Rose would be gone. They are frustrated. They, uh, the What Barkley does and Ernie Johnson do is something that has outpaced ESPN for and everybody for so long that, the, uh, that Silver himself does not like that that studio show is not better, so it'll change again. Mike McCarthy pointed out that ESPN has now made it very easy for Skip Bayless to find a successor. I don't think yeah. any of the people who were let go would people would be people who Skip Bayless would want as a successor. But I did see that Skip Bayless said that Lil Wayne was going to be on a lot more, which is smart <sighs> to uh, keep him and that younger. But I don't. That's not younger anymore. Well, it's. Well, is he it's, now old? Yes. Little Wayne. Little Wayne. Yeah. Oh, he is old, but he is younger than Shannon Sharp, and he is much younger than Skip Bayless, and he he would help just from a fame standpoint. His uh, his sports acumen, though, is something that I am not sure that I want opposite uh, anybody debating in a frequent fashion. Is Lil Wayne in the same breath now as MC Hammer? No. Like let, in that no, age? No, no. Let, me, no, let me ask this. Apologize. Let me ask, and, and Tony, with respect, you now, when you say no like that, Guess what? You're coming over on our side now because the things that you grew up with, now you're like, that's not old, that's in. But I'm going to tell you, <laughs> there's a tweet that's, I don't even know if this tweet is true or not. It's That's not the point, but <laughs> Bol Bol, Bol Bol got, got waved, and there's a guy who tweeted that Bol Bol doesn't care about basketball. He just wants to hang out with Destroy Lonely and Ken Carson all day. And I was like, who the hell is Destroy Lonely and Ken Carson? And that's how you know you're old. Well, because those guys, the people who listen to that music, do you know who that is, Mike? 
I it, I want to go back to the Lil Wayne thing. Yeah, that's a no. Well, no, because Mike I, expert. I wasn't listening because I was looking up Lil Wayne's age because he's forty years old. So he's just one year older than Future. He's just been doing this for so long. When he was a member of the Hot Boys, he was fifteen years yeah. old. He's the same age as Nicki Minaj. Yes, but they've been in the side guys for totally different amounts of time. Yes, but, but Amin is now saying that that's part of the older crew now. Even even if he was yeah, twenty five, yeah. thirty five, excuse me. Yeah, he like, peaked in like what oh nine. It, it's there. There's. I've reached the age where there are artists I literally have never heard. Like, I read this tweet and I said in my group chat, who the F is Detroit Lon- or Destroy Lonely and Ken Carson? Yeah, I don't know And And one of my buddies says, my nephew thinks th- these are the greatest rappers ever. Yeah, I, that's, I don't know them. That's, that's what I'm saying That's how right I felt now. when I saw So if Blue you say Face. we're going to get Lil Wayne so we get younger, I mean, I guess younger – from 50 to 40, but not younger t- towards a young generation. But are you more concerned with his acumen than his age? And your concern is quality again. I don't think concern is the right way to say it because I think my overall larger concern is the dog whistling that that show does in pitting a white guy against a black guy. Lil Wayne is going to play. What? Is that what that show is? W- w- Lil Wayne is going to play to some stereotypes that are just going to make that all the easier. Um, just uh, just by doing Lil Wayne things and creating the, the chasm that exists there. What are you laughing about? What's Lil Wayne things? Just, Don't let him describe. Just, just being Lil Wayne. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Just being Lil Wayne is going to allow. You know what the formula is on those shows. Pit a white guy against a black guy and, and feed some of the divide that exists there. Work for boxing. I mean, and it works for argument television, too. I, I, formulaically, I understand why they do it. It disappoints me that they do it, but I understand why it works. But I thought that your whole thing with ESPN and the whole conversation we're having is your concern about the quality of the medium in which you are now in. And you, you're saying you got out of ESPN just in time. You're talking about as your concern of being one of the ones who would have been axed or you're concerned that ESPN has become something that cares more about versatility than quality or more about money than quality. Well, I have to be careful, okay, how I talk about some of this stuff just because no matter what I say gets viewed through the prism of somehow people think I'm bitter or angry or jealous, even though I talked about ESPN freely while I was on ESPN. I just saw a hugely sad day And I understand how a company can make all of us disposable because most of us are. Most of us in this industry are. And I don't think if argument television and dog whistling is going to win in the ratings, I don't think the customer is doing a whole lot of discerning about this is a quality thing that I'm watching. People have heard me talk before about ESPN, my show, so that you don't think I'm criticizing ESPN. Highly questionable was just an infomercial that could have been any show in the world from 4.30 to 5 on ESPN. They could have chosen any show in the world and it would have been an infomercial that just got you to the next games. That's what most of the programming on ESPN is. They've got too many hours to fill for much of it to be good. It's too much landscape. It's difficult to do this. It's like when people compare Super Bowl ratings to previous years. The, the way that we consume has changed so much. But it's irrefutable that... ESPN Radio, when they come from the heydays of Mike and Mike, Colin Cowherd, SVP, and Levitard in their lineup, they've never been able to make that back up. Rosillo, too. They have never been able to recapture that audience and that revenue from the decisions that they've made from a quality control aspect. And even though the times have changed in daytime television as well, they have never been able to recoup the audience that they lost from Beatle and Cowherd doing Sports Nation to what The Jump was doing to what Highly Questionable was doing. They haven't been able to recoup that. And so if we're just doing a numbers game, we can say quantifiably their decisions in the past have shown that they've lost audience, and it's safe to assume that they'll continue to lose audience with these new decisions. But it's the equation that's changed also. And I think we're not giving enough credit to what is going on in ESPN's head and what's above in Disney. When you've got all the consolidation that we've seen in the industry, you saw it over with uh, Discovery, and Mm -hmm. you saw it with Viacom and CBS, where I was. The, the, The object from above is, hey, I don't care how you do it, but you've got to reach this number by this date. Then you look at what are the underlying financials of your show, which you're calling an infomercial on the way to a game. Is that how you described what your content was? Almost all of the things on ESPN are that. Then why would I pay someone 
X plus Y to do that infomercial when I can pay someone X minus Y. Correct me if I'm wrong. I just rattled off from the top of my head moves that they've made over the last 15 years that have shown that they've lost audience because of quality control. Is the only thing that's actually gained audience from the decisions that they've made, the content decisions that they've made, NFL Live? Is that the only thing that's improved, both from a quality standpoint and a good rating story to tell? Is that the only decision that they've made recently? SVP Midnight Sports Center. Yeah, they have some good stories to tell when they put a, an emphasized focus on Sports Center. Yeah. But you're saying quality control, and I would say it's a number of different factors that include, and this is empirical, it's beyond streaming and people living off the grid and getting away from cable television because they just don't want to pay for cable television. Empirically, young people are less interested in sports. That's, that's so. That's like to me. It's all. If we're talking about why the numbers have gone down, Mike, it's that. It's uh, the, the cord cutting. It's all that stuff first. But good content reflects an sure. audience gain because uh, NFL Live, we all agree, is a, probably the best thing they do from a daytime program. I would argue that its ratings are worse today than they were ten years ago. But they're better than what they were. Like, yeah, everything's worse. But that's than my worse point. Like, years, but, but they like, were better than what they were three years but ago. I, I think most of this, most of the drain. Is not because of the the dropping. I'm not saying a drop in quality hasn't happened. I'm just saying that isn't the biggest factors in terms of what their numbers are. But I do want to point out, man. I had a crazy dream the other night, and I wrote it down. And I didn't even think it would come in relevant. I didn't even mention it in the pre. You wrote it down. I wrote it. A written down. down dream. It's a long dream, but I'm just gonna get to the relevant part. There's a party at my house, and there's a rumor going through the party that Kobe Bryant is at the party, and I'm like, what? And so I make my way through the crowd to kind of see, and then I see the person that people think is Kobe Bryant, and this guy's like a, two inches taller than I am, and he's got hair, but it's kind of patchy. And, and so i like, this isn't Kobe, but I come up to him and say, what's up? And he says, what's up? And his voice sounds a lot like Kobe, and I'm like, he kind of looks a little like him, but I know clearly it's not him. As I turn back to go back to my friends and tell them, yo, it's false. Michael Jordan is literally leaning against the wall over here. Now, mind you, there are people swarming around Kobe trying to get a picture, an autograph. Michael Jordan's standing right here, nobody notices. And I said, what's up, Mike? And he's like, yeah, nothing much. And I'm like, isn't it funny these guys think that it's Kobe? He's like, yeah. And I walk back to my friend group. By the way, my friend group is Mike Wilbon and Dan Patrick. Don't ask me why. And I say to them verbatim, and that's how you know the consumer does it. Because the real Michael Jordan is standing right there. And all you guys are trying to take pictures with not even the real Kobe Bryant, who in my dream isn't dead. He's alive. So I say all this to say that I was I was hoping. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, that not we were gonna I, get I, I Let my like, boy cook. I feel like I wish he hadn't no, no. said any of no, it no, no. or written it. No, in, in no, his no. Notes. No, there, 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 there's a there's an end. I wouldn't have brought it up again. I wasn't gonna bring up this dream at all today, but now we're talking about it. You talk about quality drop. I would argue what Dan said a little bit ago. These people don't know what they're watching. These are the same people who think that, like, uh, when someone is yelling something on first take, they are reporting. And they're equating, oh, you guys are biased when people like Brian Winhurst or people like uh, Seth Wickersham are doing actual reporting. They're like, no, you're biased. I know these media types. And the examples they bring up are Skip and Shannon and Stephen A and Mad Dog. And I'm like, they can't even discern opinion from news breaking what makes you think they can discern quality programming from just people yelling they can't even discern uh patchy haired kobe bryant from, from michael jordan from a, yeah dream. from a real michael jordan these people don't know or mc hammer from lil wayne i would just like to know do you write down every dream you have or this one you felt was especially interesting he for thought the this show? was content worthy <laughs> no, no. what happened there tony back me up he does write down almost all of his dreams that he can remember, yep. but also they weave really well into the show. How did this weave into the show? No, we're, don't say it again. We're talking I take about, that back. We're talking Can about I, people, wait, yeah, stop. Uh, the uh, consumer, David. We're the talking consumer. about consumer not knowing. Yeah. David, go sit in the penalty. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. Go, go away for a little while. Um, I mean, how do you not understand exactly how well placed that story was about Kobe and Michael Jordan, especially after he explained to you the tie in with ESPN and the consumer not being able to discern? My bad. Uh, get out of here. Wilbon and Dan Patrick, huh? Those are my boys in my dream. What time night wrap up? 6.30? <laughs> what was the age? What age were they?
I honestly can't help but laugh when they start mentioning these movies from the 70s and 80s. <laughs> and what I see sweep over the faces of Jessica, Jeremy, and Tony is just an abject confusion. <laughs> Uh, if I I don't think that I would get a much different reaction if uh, you know a, a rodeo bull ran through uh, behind them because they don't know what you guys are talking about. Uh, the movies that you're mentioning are are comedic classics. If you're around fifty, <laughs> if uh, it, the fifty, I can't believe Jessica just said that your list, David, is. The average year of release is 1982. 1982 is, it's 20 years before Jessica and Jeremy are born. What was the average of Adnan's list? I I missed one of them, so I did, I tried to average it, and I when I would divide it by five, it gave me an answer that didn't make sense, so I'm totally lost now. Adnan, if you could send me your list, I will do the math. I assume- Jess, I'll do it right now. The 2013 being, this is the end, that is going to skew it much more relevant than yours. I am so absolutely throwing the challenge flag to Adnan putting in this is the end after the fact. I'd like to know, because his review of this is the end did not seem as though it was as prepared as his reviews of the others. So I believe he was kowtowing to the group by putting that in the list. Just, just, just a ridiculous assertion, David. How <laughs> dare you try to impugn my integrity and accuse me of kowtowing to millennials. Like That's that's low even for you, honestly. <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself, yeah, well, sir. Kowtowing to millennials is a less low way of saying it than the way he said it the first time, <laughs> which is to take out a kerchief and <laughs> accuse you of <laughs> performing cunnilingus on, on everybody. these films. Every, yeah. every Listen, David, do you think like, that I had space balls at number four? Like, do you want it, blazing saddles? I mean, there's plenty of others I could have gone with here. Let's go to some of the... Uh, I imagine um, that Adnan and uh, David, $5, $5, Jessica, even for a comedic effect. Uh, Adnan and David, I believe, are going to be really... Ma uh, five more dollars for... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 15 total dollars. <laughs> 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 All of a sudden, I'm Stallone in Demolition Man. Speaking of old movies. Ooh, the three seashells. Um, let's go ahead and get uh, five top five movies of all time comedies for millennials. Jessica, you go number fir uh, num uh, You go first at uh, number five. OLI Baby J. Shout out John Mulaney, huh? <laughs> it's not a movie. <laughs> number five, Lady Bird. Wow. What? Number four, Vine. Number three, Bo Burnham's YouTube channel. <laughs> Number two, TikTok. <laughs> These are not movies. Ever. Number one, Barbie. <laughs> oh, man, Barbie's going to be so good. Can't wait. They hijacked the entire segment from you. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. Those aren't com I thought they were actually going to come with a list of movies. I've seen more funny on two TikTok in the last two weeks than any of the movies you named. David. Also, there's two movies on that list. Mike Ryan, your list Stop of... Stop being such a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> it's from Lady Bird. I happen to think Lady Bird is a great movie. Well, with then you Laurie knew what Metcalf, the line was from. But I also don't happen to think that it is considered a top comedy. I Correct. Mean, when, you, when you go through the last 10 years, I think it's OLI, which starts my list. Lady Bird, OLI. These are the top five movies, stop, the top five comedies over the last 10 years. Also, OLI, the most recent film on my list, Palm Springs. Ooh. Great. It's 2020. It's a great movie. Yeah. Good All call. Right. So, number five from 2016, Pop Star, Never Stop Stopping. I loved that. I did. Fantastic. Uh, Andy Samberg's very creative, very clever of the songs. Again, skewering celebrity culture. Excellent. Not a laugh riot, my number four, but uh, a scene at a party is super memorable. The director ended up getting canceled, so I don't think we'll ever get a sequel to this film, and I really wish we did because the duo works so well together. And it's also a Christmas movie, like all Shane Black movies. The Nice Guys from 2016 is my number four. Adnan, Very mediocre. Adnan uh, is me shaking. mediocre is the right word there. I, I know Mike's stretching because the last ten years have not been great, but I I saw it once and found it instantly forgettable. Number three, Mike. Number three, The Disaster Artist from 2017. <laughs> I did like that movie. Tommy Wiseau. Good choice. Very yeah. funny. 
Uh, I'm beginning to realize that in order for you to have a movie that is in my top five, you need to get canceled over the last 10 years because James Franco ain't making any more great comedies. And it's a shame because in 2013, we agree on this. This is the end. And it holds up, by the way. And number one. You, you could- Go ahead. Go ahead, Ed. I was going to guess this number one, but I'm, I might, the Hangover. I got to guess is Mike is going to. You're go not going to no, guess, guess it. Guess no, the, the the Hangover is not. I think cheap laughs. I I barely laughed watching the Hangover. Lowest common denominator type of comedy. Same reason I, even though I enjoyed Deadpool as a concept, I didn't find it as funny as everybody else did. Tony, why are you shaking your head at Mike? Hangover? Was awesome. Mike was just you do- know, no. I rest does, my case, and it does not hold up. <laughs> the defense rests. <laughs> Number one from 2019, <laughs> The Lighthouse. <laughs> so, so that so that's gonna be number one. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Way to go, Mike. Losing his mind with Robert Pattinson. At what point, Robert Pattinson says that movie? If I had a steak, I would f- it. That's the funniest movie the last ten years. Five dollars. Always with the farts. <laughs> For those who have not seen The Lighthouse, it is one of the bleakest things ever put on film. Also a Christmas movie, like The the Nice Guys. So they would make my top five Christmas movies as well. The the assignment was top five comedies of all time, was it No, no, no. Well, for me, it was the last uh, ten years. But the interest with getting millennials to say, what are your top five all-time greatest comedies? Mm -hmm. The question is, from where are you getting them? The Lighthouse would be number one on all-time comedies for me, too. So it didn't matter for 10 years. So it's (laughs) all-time. It's all-time. It's an all-timer. Because I'm more interested in your all-time list than having you to have to make it. Because you've got to give credit, and it takes some time. Well, The Lighthouse is number one, and American Psycho is number two. There's a new comedy that came out this weekend that I think is going to end up on a lot of people's lists. No Hard Feelings with Jennifer Lawrence. I went and saw it in a theater and everybody was laughing out loud. It's been like a decade since The Hangover, since I've gone to a movie in the theater and laughed out loud with other people like this. And it was crazy because he basically Jennifer Lawrence is playing off a younger actor and part of the plot. And he said this is going to be the first movie that I've ever gone to the theater and laughed out loud with other people because basically, like you just pointed out, Mike, over the last decade, there really haven't been that many blockbusters. This was so, so funny. And to a degree, it's falling victim to the the times changing a little bit because it's considered very risque. And what I like so much from the trailers that I saw is Jennifer Lawrence doesn't really care about all that stuff and she's fully committed that's what makes it so good she's all out in this role and making it a raunchy comedy but what makes it kind of genius is in a lot of the points where there are certain plot points that maybe would make you a little uncomfortable in modern comedy standards they find a way to sort of explain and justify those things without hitting you over the head with it it's really good jess and and i were just talking right now and i think uh if i'm going with lighthouse and american psycho as an all-time comedy then uh, comedies over the last 10 years i put the menu up there because it was a great Mm. dark comedy and i'm putting knives out on mine Adnan, what are your thoughts on why it is uh, the last 10 years have been as bad as they are? Is it just that everyone's afraid? I think that's a big part of it, Dan. I think that, you know, obviously all these performers look around and say, okay, comedy has to be fearless. You have to be willing to be brazen and offend and shock and amuse and annoy and be provocative. And You've seen now with people going too far and saying, no, you can't make those jokes anymore. That's offensive. That therefore can't be tolerated. I just can't imagine if Mel Brooks is around today. You know, imagine if if Don Rickles is around today. Those guys, they wouldn't be able to exist in today's climate. Now, that's a major part of it, Dan. But also there's a feeling that, well, perhaps rather than putting these movies in these big budget theaters, right, rather than putting there's something about Mary as an August release where it's going to be the number one film or at least in the top 10 for 15 weeks, just put it on streaming. Slide it in there, and at least then if you're shocking and offending, you're not doing so with a wide campaign, posters everywhere saying, go see this film, um, because that really just isn't the case anymore. I think there's an avenue for comedies, but it's more via streaming, and I miss those big budget offensive raunchy comedies. Yeah, they're not they're not greenlighting them anymore and I'm surprised that Adnan you didn't correct me because a Martin Scorsese film does make, meet the cutoff in 2013 Wolf of Wall Street which Oh is, yeah. DiCaprio has one of the single greatest uh Sequences. physical comedy bits yeah. you'll ever Quaaludes. see on film. The Quaaludes, the expired Quaaludes? 
you can't incredible. spoil that, right? It's ten years old. Well, let's uh, let's next week do best uh, moments of physical comedy in the history of the movies because physical comedy is a a whole different beast. My my thing about canceling, if we can take a minute on this, Mike's list, and he told you that there won't be movies that follow up sequels because they've been canceled. So if we're canceling everyone who's funny because of what they're doing when they're trying to do what's funny. That's when we're not. Well, no, I don't think that's happened. Been, I don't think that has ever happened because their movies yeah. are Shane Black. If you, that's what I'm saying. It's to their, you. The, the the behavior of the directors He's, away from the movie. If you look at Shane Black's behavior on set, especially during the Predator reboot, because he was a part of the original cast, you can understand why a place like Hollywood would never give him another chance. No, but this is my point. What Adnan was talking about are people who say things that are objectionable. When he talks about Rickles, he's talking about that their comedy may not exist today. When you're talking about Franco, it's not that his movies won't make it right now. It's he can't make them. So I'm giving you a difference, which is canceling people for what they do off screen versus canceling people for what they do on screen. And right now there is a bigger concern. People don't want to take the chance to be canceled on screen, which is why you're getting fewer and fewer quality movies. But no one's being canceled that way. There aren't movies being made no, where just people are actually canceled because for you, anything that's being aired. Because they won't make them. They don't pass the test. Yeah, they're if afraid. we gave you and Skipper a script that had aggressive comedy in it, are you going to produce it? Well, I would like to take chances with art. So, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to see it, but I'd like to take chances. Uh, your, your This hypothetical script, Dan, is very racist. Do you green light it, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> see you later, Adnan. Good talking to you. Appreciate your time, sir. It's a yes or no question. <laughs> As always, a pleasure. By the way, average release of my movie is 1994. So, old man Samson, at it again. Pleasure, guys. Uh, yes see you or later. no? We will talk Please to you next no. week. Is the movie Tropic Thunder? That's not getting made today. I, everyone associated with it readily admits it. And I do think there's a way to definitely do it. Uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Walks this line constantly. But they do it in a way that kind of holds up a mirror to society. I just invoke society when trying to talk smart. We live in a society. No! Oh! <laughs> if it's not a no, it's a yes. South Park, The Simpsons, even The Simpsons. Even The Simpsons got checkmated just on... Say no. Just say no. Please, Dan. <laughs>